Hello again gamers, welcome back to the Board Game Captain. I'm the Captain and today I'm going to be reviewing and talking about and telling you how you play Blade Runner, the role-playing game from Free League Publishing. Uh, now, I want to give a big thank you to Free League Publishing for this free review copy of Blade Runner, the role-playing game. Um, I have been super excited for this. If you guys watch my channel, you know I did a news story on this. Uh, way back when it was originally announced, um, and Free League has been really hitting it out of the park with all their official IP games. They did a great job with the Alien role-playing game and and, the, and their new edition of the One Ring, etc. Uh, so I've been super excited to see what they were going to do for this. So I want to give a big thank you to Free League Publishing for this review copy to be able to use in my games as well as to film some content with. Uh, before I get too into this review, I do want to say I've got a ton of links in the description down below that you can check out at your leisure. There's a link to BoardGameCaptain.com, which is a great hub for all things Board Game Captain. There's also a link to my Teespring store. You can get yourself some cool Board Game Captain merch, t-shirts, mugs, etc. And there's a link to my Patreon if you're in a position to and would like to support the channel. Alright, so Blade Runner the role-playing game. Uh, this is the Blade Runner role-playing game, a neon noir wonderland that will take your breath away, one way or another. An evocative world of conflicts and contrasts that dares to ask the hard questions and investigate the power of empathy, the poison of fear, and the burden of being human during inhumane times. An iconic and unforgiving playground of endless possibilities that picks you up, slaps you in the face, and tells you to wake up. Time to live or time to die. I love the blurb on the back of this book. This is, this is fantastic. All right, so what's in the book? Let's run through it. So the first thing you have when you open it on the inside of the cover is a map of uh, the... Uh, downtown LA area um, basically the central Los Angeles of the Los Angeles mega city of the Blade Runner universe next we've got the credits so the lead game designer uh, was Thomas Harenstam uh, the lead setting writer was Joel Lafavi the lead artist was Martin Grip the graphic design was done by Christian Granath and the maps were done by Christian Granath and there's a bunch more people here I'm sure I've put up, up on the screen everybody who was involved uh, then we move along and we've got the standard free league um, table of contents, the way they do the different chapters and the breakdowns of the chapters with the little illustrations above, which I always really like. Uh, then we get into the preface where, where we have a um, preface from Thomas Hirenstam about his history with Blade Runner uh, and the first time he saw the movie and his obsession with it, etc. Uh, actually, really cool little read. It's just a page. Uh, then we get into chapter one. Fiery, the angels fell. Now, uh, chapter one here starts off with uh, some basic ideas on um, how the universe is structured, what the world is like, um, a timeline of events that brings you from the history from before the first Blade Runner movie all the way through the first Blade Runner movie up to right before uh, Blade Runner 2049. This game itself takes place in the year 2037, so uh, very similar in the in the setting to the sequel. In fact, much more similar to the sequel than it is to the original, FYI. Of course, you can always alter the setting a bit yourself if you'd like to bring it back and be closer to the original Blade Runner movie. Uh, in addition to all of this great uh, information on the history, it gives you just general, you know, day-to-day -day life kind of information about... Uh, what what it's like to live in this universe? What the uh, what the general views are uh, that people have of replicants, etc. Then it gives you uh, general information about uh, role playing and um, role playing in this game. Uh, then you get on to chapter two, which is your Blade Runner. Now this is where you learn how to make your character. Uh, character creation in this is very easy and very nice. Uh, I really like it. Uh, they have a, uh, the system itself is a next step evolution, if you will, of the um, Year Zero engine that, play, that most of Free League's games are based on. But it also seems to have taken a bit of inspiration from 
uh, one of their other systems, the system they use for the Twilight 2000. So it feels to me like they took some of the best stuff from the Year Zero engine, some of the best stuff from Twilight 2000, mixed it together, and uh, put it into this game. So uh, character creation stats no longer, like in previous editions of the Year Zero engine, are no longer the number of six-sided dice you get. Instead, they are the size of die you use, much more like the system in Twilight 2000. Uh, but in going through this, it's not just about your stats and, uh, and your skills. It's also about your um, your your background. Uh, if you are a person, a, a major memory that has a huge influence on your life, a major attachment, a person in the world that has a huge influence on your life. If you are a replicant, a implanted memory that you know is fake but still has a major effect on who you are and, and how you live. Um you know, all, all the details that you put together to create your character. Now, when creating your character, there are a bunch of archetypes for creating your character. These are sort of like character classes, uh, but on a lighter side of things, because they're not, you know, they're not as restrictive as character classes usually are in other role-playing games. Uh, but they, they, they give you uh, some, you know, key attribute, key skills, uh, your starting amount of money, uh, specialties to choose from, also some, some normal names. Uh, the, the different archetypes we have in here are analyst, city speaker, doxy, enforcer, fixer, inspector, and skimmer. Uh, so they are all very different. Uh, they, they focus on different areas of the game. Uh, some are more about investigation, while others are more about connections, while others are more about combat. Uh, but they're all very uh, interesting. And generally speaking, any of these can be taken, whether you are playing a replicant or a human. Uh, you have the option to either be a replicant or a human, or even be a secret replicant, which of course goes in line uh, with some of the ideas that Ridley Scott had himself about Decker for the original movie. Ideas that I do not subscribe to, but uh, it is in there. You could be a secret replicant with memory implants and not know that you are actually a replicant. And that is an option in there, which could be really interesting. Uh, as a game master, you could do this for one or more of your player characters and not even tell them and have them discover it during the game, which that is really cool and I really like. Now, the next chapter, chapter three, is skills and specialties. So here we get into the skills and how the dice rolls work. So similar to older versions of the Year Zero engine, you're looking for sixes. But now you can have larger dice than sixes. And uh, while six is a success, a 10 is two successes. So when you roll a skill, you take the die size for your uh, relevant skill, the die size for its linked attribute, and you roll them together. Uh, a six will be a success. A 10 will be two successes. Your skill at the lowest level or attribute at the lowest level gives you a six sided die, a D6. The next level up gives you a D8. The next level up from that gives you a D10. And the highest level possible is a D12. So as you can see, a D6, you have one in six chance of getting a success. A, D, a D8, suddenly you have a six, seven, and eight, a three and eight chance of getting a success. On a D10, a 6, 7, 8, or 9 will get you a success, but a 10 will get you two successes. And you see how this goes as you ramp it up. Uh, this is actually really cool, and in my opinion, a huge uh, level up from the standard um, the standard system of the Year Zero engine. I actually really like this upgrade. I think it's, it's much better than just getting more dice and only looking for sixes. I like this a lot more. And like I said before, this does feel like a merger of the Year Zero engine as well as the Twilight 2000 engine. It feels like you're getting the best of both worlds, and, and that is really cool. Now, next we have Chapter 4, which is Combat and Chases. So when you're shooting at somebody, basically you roll your skill for uh, shooting, and that's it. But if you're doing a hand-to-hand -hand combat both and you're in close range, both you and your opponent roll your relevant skills. Whoever gets the higher automatically gets to hit the other person. So be careful if, you know, you're fighting someone with a nightstick and they're using a, uh, a board with a nail in it and they roll higher than you, they're going to hit you even though it was your action to try to hit them. Uh, now, if you have armor, you get to roll your armor's dice and every success gets to reduce one of the damage that is incoming. Um, 
yeah, so there's 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 a lot of interesting things in here. There's also, of course, critical injuries um, that you can get. And if you are broken by damage uh, and you get hit again, you will get automatic critical injuries. Some of the critical injuries, some of the more severe ones, are fatal. Uh, some of the lesser ones, though, you could still be healed up from. You could still uh, get some, some first aid and come back from. But this can be a fairly lethal system. Not the most lethal system I've ever seen, but it is very possible to have characters die in this. You know, with, with high caliber weapons and such, it should be. The chapter also covers vehicle combat, which is really cool uh, because, of course, there can be weapons mounted on spinners. Uh, so, you know, it, it's good to have that in here. It also covers chases, both on foot and using vehicles. Uh, really well done. I really like this system. Now, the next chapter is Chapter 5, A Tale of Two Cities. Uh, so, now we get into the the full explanation the full deep dive of what life is like in la for both the haves and the have not that is what they mean by the tale of two cities uh what is it like for the ultra rich and what is it like for the everyday downtrodden in this post po basically post-apocalyptic world where the majority of humanity have moved off world and the rest of humanity are bunched together in these mega cities, either trying to find a way to get themselves off world or just trying to find a way to survive day to day life in the mega city. Then we have full breakdowns of all the different sectors of LA. What's there? What are interesting places? What are interesting people you could find there? Um, really, really well done. Chapter six is the powers that be. Now here we start to get into, you know, things like the UN, the police department, the big mega corporations. Who are they? What are their goals? What do they have power over? Who actually has more power over who? And spoiler alert, it's the corporations who usually have the most power, though even they have to watch out a little bit and lobby the UN uh, for control. Then chapter seven is working the case. So this gives you uh, a lot of idea on, on your resources at police headquarters and different things you can do to investigate a mystery. Most of the cases in here should be done like a neo-noir neo mystery. Uh, and it gives you lots of, lots of information on how to do that. This is a great chapter for both the game master and the players to learn how to work their way through a game. Chapter eight is tools of the trade. Now this is the toy box. Here we have information on computer systems, VoIP comp uh, uh, systems, the um, the baseline tests from the sequel movie, uh, lots of weapons, not just you know the the standard issue Blade Runner weapon, but other weapons you could find uh, standard, just you know 357 Magnums, 12 gauge. Uh, or excuse me, 20 gauge shotgun, sniper rifles, things like that, that you could find on your enemies. And then in addition to the PKD 5223 blaster, which is the standard Blade Runner gun, we have an upgraded version, which is the PKD FKM 890, which is the newer model. Um, in addition to lots of standard close combat weapons, body armor and other kinds of armor and explosives and projectile weapons of other types. Uh, this is a really, really nice toy box that includes lots of things, both from the movies and just, you know, general things uh, that should be in a cyberpunk setting like this, including, uh, you know, cybernetic augmentation, something that they didn't really talk a lot about in the Blade Runner movies, but they have in here uh, how much, it, you know, it generally would cost to get yourself uh, augmented or for other characters to have augmentations what they do for them it also includes information on vehicles including all the different kinds of flying vehicles uh like the spinners there are multiple kinds of the spinners uh there's even a spinner hover cycle which is really cool and ground vehicles then we have a whole section on shopping destinations places to buy all of this stuff before getting to the next chapter Chapter 9, Running Blade Runner. So here we have, this is purely just advice for the Game Master. It includes uh, tables for downtime events and, and um, uh, tables for helping you to create a case, helping you to create a case for your players to, uh, to go on an adventure with. It also includes a whole section, which I really uh, enjoyed, on specific ways to enhance your player's experience. Uh, they recommend things like, if you can, turning down the lights. If you have neon lights you can put on, neon lights 
uh, really helped to set the mood, as well as putting on appropriate music low in the background. Uh, it could be, of course, the soundtracks to either movie or both. Uh, or other types of music that, again, make everybody feel very cyberpunk. As well as if you turn down the lights, maybe having a spotlight, like a single light to keep the table well lit. All of these things um, were really kind of cool. Also, it recommended using glasses uh, that looked like they were from a bar for everybody. Um, you know, like from the bar scenes in the movies for everybody while they're having drinks at the table uh, playing the game. Uh, very fun. Uh, this book is incredibly well put together. Um, the, the game system is, in my opinion, an, a full-on upgrade from the previous iterations of the Year Zero engine. Um, I really like the Year Zero engine. I think, in my opinion, of the basic Year Zero engine, and there have been slight differences from game to game. My favorite implementation before this was in the Alien RPG. Uh, but this version where they took some of the best things from the existing Year Zero engine and combined them with some of the best things from the Twilight 2000 game system, I really think is a huge upgrade. This is really fantastic. I really like that they did this. Now on the downside, I had a minor thing that I was really hoping uh, was going to be possible that is not really possible without some work by you as the Game Master, which is that since this was going to be based on the Year Zero engine, I was hoping you were going to be able to uh, cross-pollinate content from the Blade Runner role-playing game and the Alien role-playing game so you could use stuff from both in your game. And that is not actually possible without some extra work because the system has changed so much. But this is a minor gripe and really not something that was advertised that they were going to be able to do with this. So it's just something I had wanted to do. But this this gripe of mine is, is so minor and so, you know, I just wanted to mention it because I talked about it when I originally did my news video when I knew that this was coming, that I was excited to be able to do that. You're not really able to do that, at least without some extra work. Uh, but that said, I think this is now my favorite implementation of the Year Zero engine. I really hope going forward in future games, they keep this idea of using the multiple die sizes. That is really great. I think the multiple die sizes is awesome. Um, this book is really well produced, very sturdy, hardcover, old school, thread binding, full color, uh, glossy pages, really, really nicely done. Um, and the contents are some of the best I have ever read in a role-playing game. And it is one of my favorite universes already because I'm a huge fan of the Blade Runner movies, both of them. So, yeah, uh, I I love this. Uh, I don't know if you can tell that I'm raving. Uh, I am going to give the Blade Runner, the role-playing game, 10 out of 10 stars. This is absolutely phenomenal. If you are a fan of the Blade Runner movies, either or both, and you are a fan of cyberpunk settings, and you would like to try to play in such a thing, this is a great game for you. This game is made to be emphasis on the role in role-playing. You are very much all about uh, setting the mood, playing out a mystery, uh, collecting evidence, and 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 really, really, you know, all about the the characterization, the characters diving deep into backstory, diving deep into important, tough decisions about your humanity versus you know just getting the job done and what your superiors want from you. And, and this is really cool. This is very well done. And I love it. And I love it. 10 out of 10 stars. Uh, really briefly, I didn't get to talk about the advancement system in this too much. There are two points you earn um, during the game. You earn humanity points and you earn career points. And the career points are used to help you earn commendations towards getting uh, promotions and raises to buy more loot and stuff. Because uh, as you get, if you get a promotion, you get more money. Uh, which then you could use to translate into more loot. But uh, humanity points are what actually you can use to, to increase your um, skills. Uh, you get a certain number and you can actually start raising up the skills. The higher the skills are, the more it costs to raise them up all the way up to their maximum of a D12. Yeah, this game is fantastic. Definitely love it. Definitely would recommend it to you. So let me know in the comments down below. Have you tried the Blade Runner role-playing game yet? Or have you... Uh, read the book yet, bought it yet. What do you think? Are you excited for this game? Are you a big fan of Blade Runner? Talk talk to me in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this review of a role-playing game and you'd like to see me do more like it, be sure to give it a like, 
shared on all forms of social media. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the board game Captain. That's Captain spelled with K on YouTube. And until next time, game on.